Okay. So, um, good evening. Welcome. Uh, my name is Fred Pellard. I'll be your host and entertainer uh, from the uh, for the next hour or so. Uh, we've got Anastasia from A Small World in the background, helping manning the uh, the chat box as well. And uh, so, I'm gonna, uh, without further ado, I'm gonna share a couple of um, uh, slides with you, and then I'll tell you a bit more about the format. Um, so, what we're gonna do? I'm gonna first introduce myself. Uh, we're gonna talk about. Uh, what it is uh, or how to be strategic. There'll be uh, three sections uh, to the talk. And what I suggest is to make it a bit easier is we'll do sort of one section at a time. And then typically at the end of each section, I'll have a look at the q and I'll pick a couple of questions. As I'm sure you know, the, the webinar format is a little bit less interactive than the, the traditional sort of... Um, uh, sort of meeting uh, approach in Zoom, but we can still, you know, so feel free if you have any question, put them in the Q&A and I'll start sort of every 15 minutes and I'll come back and have a look. So if we start, uh, let me tell you a bit about me. And so uh, I'm Fred Pillard. I'm French by birth. You could probably hear it in the accent. I'm also British as of uh, very recently after 25 years in London. I'm London based. I'm a rocket scientist by training and a strategist by trade. Um, I started my career uh, as a rocket scientist, then uh, worked with Deloitte, then did an MBA at INSEAD in France, and then joined a strat consulting firm, which was a Bain and McKinsey spinoff for five years, then set up my own consulting firm. Um, over the last, let's call it 15 years, I really specialize a lot on how to help, also helping people becoming more strategic. And I do that in three ways. Uh, talks, as we're going to do tonight. Uh, training, which typically is sort of groups of up to 50 people, two days, obviously by Zoom now, but historically sort of in real, uh, in real life. And then, of course, I, I do lots of projects with clients. And uh, clients of either training or consulting. And I've, I've sort of uh, I always organize them by industry, which apart from the nice humble brag of this little um, display, you can also recognize sort of retail, financial services, uh, consulting, uh, media, uh, healthcare, etc. So the techniques we're going to see work in every uh, industry. They're really generic about thinking strategically. And then the second comment is, I'm going to try and pitch it sort of not too professional, but at the sort of the boundary between the professional space and the personal space. Because effectively, thinking strategic, the difference between strategy and strategic. Now, strategy is often perceived as, you know, what happens in the corner office once used to be maybe once every three years. Now it's probably a bit more frequent once every year, every six months, but undertaken by the senior people in the management team. Strategic is something that all of us um, have to contemplate on a very frequent basis. You know, every day you go, what's the most strategic thing you could be doing? And so because strategic is more widespread and is of relevance to way more people, I was approached a couple of years ago by uh, Penguin, who asked me to sort of turn that into a book, uh, which exists, and the book is now, it's called How to Be Strategic. And in How to Be Strategic, um, we, you'll see sort of 12 techniques um, and each of these, I typically use an ex a professional example and a personal example, okay? So that's been in a chat. Uh, what are we going to do uh, today? First, we're going to talk about the strategic mindset. So how is thinking strategically different from the three other ways to think? So, and we'll see that the three other ways to, to think in in include sort of um, the uh, expert mode, the analytical mode and the creative mode. I'm going, to, I'm going to introduce that very shortly. Then we'll take a small pause. I'll gather, you know, I'll have a look through the chat. I'll look at some of the questions and then answer maybe two or three. And then we'll move on to the first big technique called the pyramid principle. And the pyramid principle is a fantastic way to converge on an answer. So typically it's a great way to organize your thoughts when you have a loose strategic intent. You sort of know what you want to achieve um, but uh, you know, you've got the vision, but you don't know how to get there. And the pyramid principle is a fantastic way to scope that out. And then we'll see another technique called the mutation game, which is nearly doing the exact opposite. So if pyramid principle is super convergent, is you know where you want to go, but you don't really know how, the mutation game goes the other way. It's when you don't, you know that you don't want the situation you're in anymore. Uh, you could probably imagine that, you know, uh, for the last few years, mutation game people thought was interesting in the last 18 months or the last year uh, with COVID. The idea that, you know, um, I, I'm, I'm happy 
you to go anywhere else as long as it's not here has happened to a lot of businesses. If you're a pub owner, if you work in hospitality, etc., inventing new either business model if you have a company or new activities if you're a freelancer is really, really important. Okay, so um, I'm, uh, by the way, I'm, I'm imagining that uh, those of you watching are either um, self-employed or uh, entrepreneurs. So you've got, you've got a, few, a small crew with you or uh, might be uh, business consultants or investment bankers or executives or amateur, just interested in anything. Uh, the techniques we're going to see will apply to all of you. Let's start with uh, the strategic mindset. So the first bit, oh, sorry. Uh, give me two seconds. I think I've had a little. Uh, aha. Sorry, just one tiny bit. Um, sorry, Birgit, if it's you, you've got the wrong link. I sent you another one before. I apologize for that. And uh, there you go. Thank you. And so let's talk about the, the strategic mindset. So the strategic mindset um, goes like this. Imagine that you're looking at a challenge for yourself, a, a big question that has been put to you by uh, your, your stakeholders. And your stakeholders, for some of you, might be uh, your romantic partner that says, you know, you need to fix X, Y, Z, or uh, your boss that says, you know, you need to uh, do something, or customers who go, we want a slightly different product. We want something a little bit um, simpler. And um, sorry, give me one second, because I, I, I have a little problem, which is I have a bit of sound that, there you go. I think that's been sorted. Apologies, I had a little sound feedback that was slightly distracting me. So um, I was saying, uh, think of all the possible activities you might be thinking of, and um, this is the time frame, and plot them on a time frame that says, how long do you have to do that? Sometimes you've got a day to sort it, sometime a week, sometime a month, a year, and then vertically, we're going to plot how far along are you when it comes to completion, okay? And you could probably see that on this map, we can plot all the projects in the world. And if we do that, uh, when a project starts, time elapses, you achieve completion. And the top right corner, you've got your answer. You know, you've solved the problem, okay? For every single project, the bottom left corner is the complexity corner. Because before you start, you go, ah, I don't know, I don't know the answer. And then hopefully, when you're finished, the top right hand is the conviction. Uh, corner. And so for most of us, a really good way to think about problem solving is problem solving is taking a group of stakeholders, you know, customers, employees, romantic partners, investors, on a journey over time from complexity to conviction. Uh, when I'm in the US, sometimes I say, you know, from darkness into the light. And where it gets really fascinating is that there's three or uh, four ways, sorry, four ways to travel from complexity to conviction. Okay. And they're each quite different. The first way to travel is the uh, staircase of expert execution. It looks like this. And it's typically a mode that people use in problem solving when they have a pretty good idea of what the endpoint looks like even before they get started. Okay. Um, for example, many of you uh, getting dressed in the morning. It might take you 5, 10, 15 minutes, and you have a pretty good idea of how you're going to get there. Arguably, past the age of, I don't know, let's call it five, all of us are expert at getting dressed. And if someone asks us, we could probably craft a work plan, which means we could give a work plan. We could, we effectively, we have become so familiar, or so expert at solving that problem that we can scope a methodology. It's a great way to solve problems. The expert mode is fantastic. And what most of us do is we like to be expert at things. We like to tell the world what we're expert at. You know, your LinkedIn profile is nothing more than all the things that you're, you're saying in the world you're expert at. And then when we're not expert, very commonly we try and look for an, another expert. So if, if, if my pretty stops here, I might hire someone else who early in the process, sometimes even before I hire them, can convince them through a work plan, some credentials, etc., that they know best what the answer looks like. And that's fabulous. So most, most problems are solved by either experts or people who hire experts. And then every so often, you find yourself with problems that nobody has cracked before. Um, and therefore, no expertise is credible. Um, if I give you one in a, in a sort of professional context, it's um, 
I work a lot with IKEA. And if you're IKEA, uh, you know that within the next few years, your big strategic challenge is what happens when Amazon moves uh, heavily into furniture. Okay, they're much more nimble. They've got a very different supply chain. They may not have the same products uh, or the same uh, sort of reputation, but they're really better at sort of quick logistics. How do you beat Amazon or how do you fend off Amazon? Nobody can say I've done it because nobody has done it. And so what you find yourself naturally doing is when you face with a problem that's never been done before, the temptation is now to go horizontal, to turn your unknowns into facts, gather quite a few, quite a bit of data, which means the project starts a little bit more slowly. Yeah, the, the progress is not as steep, but at some point you get quite a bit of data and then da -da -da, the answer emerges. Okay, And this is the submarine of analytical research. It's where you gather a lot of information and then the answer emerges. It's the deductive approach to, to problem solving, the academic approach. I'm gonna call it the analytical approach. And what the analytical approach gives you is the certainty that you derive from lots of fresh data, okay? Um, if we compare the expert and the analytical approach, one of the big difference, if you look on the vertical axis, um, and if I put a, a dotted line halfway through, anything below that, you're still in the input space or the issue space. Anything above that, thing that's already starting to look like a solution. And one of the things you might recognize is if you give an expert a certain amount of time, halfway through, you sort of want to start seeing things happening. Yeah, sort of like um, if someone is telling you they're getting dressed and you pop an eye and halfway through, you kind of, you know, a, a child, let's say, your, your child, uh, you kind of pop an eye and, and if you see socks, trousers, you, okay, it's, on, it's in progress. If you see nothing, you know that it's not happening. With the analytical approach, over time, it takes a lot longer and you only see the answer at the end. Which professions do that? Um, lawyers? Uh, re pharmaceutical researchers, specialist doctors, um, investigative journalists, engineers, uh, lots of professions, accountants, tend to follow the analytical approach when they don't have the answer. It's great. It's a fantastic way to solve problem, uh, problems. And when you ask most people, what does the strategic approach to problem solving vibe like, they tend to point to this approach. They mistake the analytical approach with the strategic approach. Um, and now we've said the analytical approach, lots of prof smart professions use it. It works really, really well with one little caveat. It only works really well if the data you need is in the past. Lawyers use past data, investigative journalists, past data, specialist doctors, past data, engineers, present data, etc., etc. So the analytical approach works really well when the problem you try and solve is in the past. Some professions spend their days solving problems in the future. And what these professions have understood is that when, you're, when the bulk of your problems are in the future, there's no such thing as facts. Because in the future, you don't have facts. You have probabilities or forecasts who usually don't materialize. So instead of turning your unknowns into facts, what you do is you obsess about structuring the chaos. And your problem-solving approach is a very steep vertical rise woohoo! in 5% of the time allocated to you. So if you've got uh, an hour, it's three minutes. If you've got a month, it's a day. If you've got a year, it's a couple of weeks. You spend 5% of the time allocated to you getting to a structure with some options. And what that structure gives you is effectively, um, and I sort of call it the helicopter of creative discovery. What that structure gives you is some great clarity where you've created uh, a set of options in the future. And if you ask yourself, which professions do that very naturally, advertising agencies, you know, if you ask an ad agency for an ad, for a campaign for your brand, the last thing they're going to do is spend a month and then give you one idea. What they'll do is they'll spend a couple of days, come back to you and say, okay, we've got three ideas. We can do this. We can do this. We can do that. Bam, 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 bam. Really quickly give you clarity around creativity. Um, now, I don't mean creativity as in, ooh, you know, soft creativity. Military officers are also taught to do things that way. Um, emergency doctors, uh, firefighters, um, uh, salespeople. There's lots of professions who, when they're faced with a problem, the last thing they do is spend is waste time gathering facts. They come up really quickly with a few options that they can put in front of stakeholders and then slowly let the stakeholder decide. And the creative bit comes with, you, you know, effectively is when we would say here, the future, the past can be analyzed 
the future can't be analyzed, it's got to be created. So when professions are very past focused, they use a lot of analytical approach. When they're more future oriented, they tend to be a bit more creative. And if you contrast the three, you can see that one of the hallmark of the creative approach is really early, you have things that start looking like a solution. Yeah. If you ask someone to uh, redo your kitchen, when you get an architect, they might sketch something and go, we could do it a bit like that or another one or another one. In no time, you'll get three sketches and then they'll talk to you, they'll discuss, and at some point you'll agree one. And so we've got these three approaches. And then the next comment, and by the way, I'm going to mention one little bit. It's if you played the sound music to each of these, you might probably recognize something. And it's a really good way to catch yourself to spot when you are, in which of these modes you are at any given point in time. The mood music of expertise is something like, You know, it's the seven dwarves coming back from work, happy to have work. They know this stuff, they're doing this thing, they've been doing forever, the experts at it. Okay, there's a kind of like pleasant mood music. One feels comfortable. The analytical mood music is a bit more like, mm, mm, oh, bugger, I'm one data point short of the perfect solution. Uh, if only the data was better, I could conclude. Yeah, it's, it's quite frustrating, it takes a lot of time in the input space. And you might recognize that the sound music of creativity is more like Tigger, you know, meow, 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 you know, believing three different ideas before breakfast. Now, we've seen these three. There's a fourth one, of course, the strategic approach. Now, what does it look like? Well, very simply put, if something is strategic for you, whether it's, you know, changing job, improving a romantic relationship, uh, raising funds for a venture, um, all the all the big strategic issue of personal life, you know, getting married, et cetera, et cetera. If it's strategic, it's in the future. If it's in the future, you're going to have very limited data. And if it's very limited data, there's only one sane way to start is to go vertical. And so you have to um, find a way to get to clarity on a range of possible options really quickly, preferably with a, with a logical structure that underpins that. And then once you've done that, we are no longer in the space of sort of creativity of, you know, sub subjectively choosing the kitchen that you like best or the suit that you prefer. But if it's in a business context in particular, you're going to have some stakeholders here that when you try and convince them of your answer, the first question they're going to go is, are you sure? In other words, show me the data. Okay, give me certainty. And therefore, if we go back to the early parts of our problem solving approach, the next stage is to now go down and destroy a lot of the options. Effectively, come up with lots of options and then test them. You can talk about them, you can analyze them, you can put them in practice. And over time, what you'll find is you're going to get less and less confident that you're, that you're going to close the, the problem because you've eliminated lots of answers until such point that you have enough data now to be quite confident of the, uh, of the validity of the last option. And now you can convince stakeholders. And what you see here is what we have is effectively a roller coaster of strategic thinking. And so the strategic approach to problem solving a really good way, a simple, possibly a bit too simple way to put it, but is to go strategic equals creative plus analytical. With creative first, analytical second, okay? And so you can see it here. We start a pretty similar to the creative approach. Then we change tack a bit and we finish a bit in the analytical approach, okay? And so... Um, uh, what you'll find in my book is effectively this chapter, which we've done together, I obviously explain a bit more, I talk a bit, I explain a bit more about the professions, etc. I give more uh, granular detail, but finally it goes, to become a good strategic thinker, you've got to learn to uh, ride first the vertical parts of the roller coaster, and in the book I call that up, you have to go up really smartly, and we'll see two of the techniques to do that, and then you have to go down intelligently, and there's a few more techniques in the book. And then you have to be able to convince your stakeholder. Okay. So thinking strategically is effectively um, being able to really quickly in the absence, in the absence of any data, crack open a future problem by revealing a structure and generating a few options. That's the other part. And then slowly put these to the test until such point that you know you, you're about to despair because most of your ideas have not worked out and then one works and that's the one you convince people is going to be uh, the right way around 
Okay, so um, I'm looking at the moment and I can't see too many questions or chats. So uh, let me uh, move along and let's start into uh, two of the techniques. So the first technique is absolutely brilliant. It's phenomenally brilliant. It's called the period principle. And the period principle was invented by an amazing uh, woman called Barbara Minto. And Barbara Minto uh, concerns herself with qualitative issues. And if you look at qualitative issues, here are a few, you know. How should we operate our business differently uh, when coming out of the pandemic? Um, should we go ahead with the investment in XYZ, you know, acquiring this machine, this product, etc.? Um, how do I keep my, my team motivated when the, you know, the recession that's coming or when people are really getting sort of lockdown fatigue? Um, should we enter the apparel market in a big way? That's a project I did for Harley Davidson a few years ago. And then, you know, more personally, how do we make our wedding the best it can be? What should I do with my life, et cetera, et cetera. One of the things you'll notice is qualitative questions uh, share two traits. The first one is the answer that you seek is a word rather than a number, you know? Uh, how should we operate? Oh, we should do blah, blah, blah. Um, how do I keep my, my, te my team motivated? I should do it. The answer is a word rather than a number. And then the second characteristic of any issue of a strategic nature like that is if you ask yourself, for example, you know, what should I do with my life? What should I do with my life? Uh, enough times, more often than not, your brain's going to go, I don't know. Because effectively, if you knew, you would ask yourself the question. If you ask yourself the question, it's because you don't know. But if you ask yourself the question without having an answer, it raises anxiety. And you end up trapped a bit in a vortex of asking yourself questions, asking your brain's, your brain, uh, your brain's questions that your brain can't answer. And Barbara Inter has found the way through that, which is a strategic beauty. And Barbara Inter goes, for every qualitative problem you can think of, the structure pre-exists your knowledge of the data. So if you think about a problem, there is a structure under it that exists anything you might know about that problem. And therefore, if there is such a structure, then the best way to get to clarity, you know, up the roller coaster quickly is to discover the structure. And then the beautiful insight is the one that is here that goes, and that structure is always the same. It's a pyramid. And so what Barbara Minter suggests and what you have in front, I might refer to them as kind of post-its or building blocks. And you can see that they've been arranged in the shape of a pyramid loosely. Okay, and what you have is you have one post-it or one building block at the top. Below that, you've got three. Between them, the, the mortar, if you will, the glue between these building blocks is the word and. Oops, sorry, I went a bit too quick. And then you go from one into three, from this one into three, from this one into three. So there's a logic you can see where you take something and you break it down. One, three, nine, 27, etc. What's the logic for breaking it down? Well, that's where we're going to come in a minute. Um, I wanted to show you first, this is kind of a, a portable pyramid. This is the shape we typically do, uh, you know, in offices where you have enough room to lay things around. Um, when you do a portable in the digital space, you've got your top issue here, three below. Below that, you've got three. And if you will, these three yellow bits here, think of them as like folded, um, uh, folded legs on a table, on a picnic table. Click. Okay, they should be under the yellow box. So what we have is one, three, nine, and then 27 horizontal. And what Barbara Minto introduces is two or three phenomenal principles that's going to help you break every problem you can think of and eliminate anxiety in a lot of future facing decision making. And it goes like this. The first thing you do when you face with a problem is don't carry the question with you, carry the outcome. Okay, so right at the top of a page or, you know, a, a notepad, a flip chart, a wall, or obviously a digital mirror or mural, right at the top, the most desirable outcome or the most difficult one to achieve. So I'm going to, I like using an example around sort of organizing a wedding and let's take it slightly outside of sort of the COVID world. Uh, let's go back to 20, let's go to 2022. Yeah. How do you organize a wedding in 2022? And can you see that if the question that you and your romantic partners are carrying is, how do we make our wedding the best it can be? How do we make our wedding the best it can be? It's very anxiety inducing. And some of you who may have gone through that will absolutely, might absolutely vouch for that. Usually when I do that in real life, you have a few people who kind of go, really? And a few people who've gone through go, yep, absolutely. There's a lot of nodding, okay? And what Barbara Mito suggests is, 
the way to deal with this is to write the beginning of a pyramid and then instead of carrying that question in your mind, how do we make our wedding the best it can be? How do we make it? Is to get rid of the question and replace it with the desirable outcome. And in this case here, instead of how do we make our wedding the best, what's the outcome we want? Oh, the outcome we want is our wedding is a great success. And so if you're right at the top, our wedding is a great success. First, you, you could probably feel that you're smiling, you're a bit less anxious, you've gone from a question to which you have no answer to an outcome that you're very clear you desire. Um, I've been helping tons of people in the, in, you know, in the last few years around things like, indeed, you know, how do, how do I take my business through COVID? How do I take my business through COVID? That is an unanswerable question. If you, on the other hand, I call that flip. If you flip the question into an outcome and you're right at the top, my business has done really well through COVID. Okay, now can you feel that? We still don't know how yet, but it's a much more interesting thing to carry in my mind. If I carry in my mind, my business is doing really well for COVID or our wedding is a great success. We flip from a question that's anxiety inducing to an outcome that's a bit more exciting. Now, if you stop there, many of you would recognize that you might call it, I don't know, uh, you know, the law of attraction or positive mental attitude. It's nice, but it doesn't quite work. And what Barbara Mito suggests, to be strategic, you've got to do a second thing. And that second thing is here and it goes, you go from the top level and you go downwards by populating and structuring a pyramid of post-its or components with one question. What would need to be true for this to be true? Okay. And so if we go to our wedding example, I'm oh, sorry, I forgot that I was saying to you. So we flipped and now we're going to split. So we go, our wedding is a great success. That flips the question into an outcome. And now we're going to split it by going, what would need to be true for this to be true? Okay. Well, if, um, our, um, I don't know, both romantic partners are very much in love and uh, there's lots of guests and uh, the weather is fabulous, then our wedding is a great success. Okay. Now, this example might, be, might feel a bit simple. Pose for a second. Can you see? The, um, you might ask yourself, uh, uh, how, do, how, does my, how does my freelance business survive COVID. Oh, shoot, shoot. Okay. Fooch, flip. My, my uh, freelance business thrived during COVID. What would need to be true? Um, uh, if, 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 um, if I find clients who uh, need the skills I have and I can find a way to offer them to these clients competitively and um, I look after myself well, uh, mental health wise, etc. then my business has thrived during COVID. Okay, now pop, pop, you've broken one thorny issue and you split it into three. And as you can imagine, I'm gonna show you in a minute, uh, but when you, when you sort of take one issue, flip it into three, nine, 27, what you found is great clarity. And um, the beauty of this technique it's like a, a Russian doll. You can use it for, you know, how do I organize my wedding or how do I do something quite personal and, 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 and comparatively simple all the way to, you know, how do I raise funds for my business? Um, how do, you know, um, uh, um, how do I make my life, you know, how do I lead, how do I lead my life? Um, how do I um, uh, accelerate my career progression? It works for everything. And the reason it's a beautiful strategic technique is if you've got a pretty good idea of what the vision is, you know, if your vision of a successful wedding, of a, of a successful fundraise, of a successful life, the pyramid helps you turn a vision into a plan by breaking it down into components. Now, if you stop here, you go, okay, that's pretty good. Let's go back one. The next question is to ask yourself, if I guide you, sorry. And obviously I'll give you that in the slides at the end. I'm um, sorry, I've clicked on something wrong there. If we go back one, you go, um, the next bit is, whoops. Once you've done a first draft, going back up, you go, can I think of a scenario where the three components are true and yet the one above is not automatically true? So uh, let's go and look that here. You go, can I think of a scenario where I've got love, I've got guests, the weather is fabulous, and yet a wedding is not automatic. Oh yes, if the, we're over budget or if the venue is double booked. Okay, let's, so let's turn weather into logistics. And now we have a second draft that we're happier with. And then the next step, uh, ignore point three here. Um, it's not that important. 
but point four and five, we've we, you see that we are going to replace the the buzzwords. We've used buzzwords so far, so love, guests, logistics. We're going to replace with full sentences, and then we're going to write the sentences as positive statement. Okay, so if we go back to examples, instead of love, we go both romantic partners are there and happy. Instead of guests, we go all the guests are there and happy. And instead of weather, we go the logistics and the weather are perfect. And can you see that if you read that again, you go, if both romantic partners are there and happy, and all the guests are there and happy, and the logistics and the weather are perfect, then our wedding is a great success. And what you might notice is you've taken what was a diffuse strategic ambition, vision, and you're slowly turning it into um, mutually additive components to get you there. And then what do you do next? Well, you could see, you do the next step. You go, both romantic partners are there and happy. What would need to be true for that to be true? Well, you go, well, I don't know. You go, if the bride is there and happy and the groom is there and happy and all the other key people are there and happy, then we've got that. Or another split might be, you know, if both romantic partners arrive at the place of ceremony uh, happily, on time and happily, and both of them have a fantastic time and say, I do during the ceremony. And then um, upon departure, both of them are sent off with, depending on cultural norms, you know, rice or cans or, or, or singing or crying or trip. And that, that's good. Then both romantic partners have been there and happy. And what we found here is effectively uh, two ways to split. So tip six in the pyramid is try to fit two structures. You can either do a deductive or inductive and very loosely i don't want to bore you with that tonight you can read it um uh, at subsequent uh, moment either in my in the slide you're going to get or in the book effectively deductive means break something into sequence so if you remember we had uh, oh they arrive at church oh they arrive at, at, at the um, at the ceremony they get married they disappear that's sequence or split it into types so types of guests oh the bride the groom etc and then continue to the next level. There you go. So here, for example, all the guests are there and happy. You might go, well, we need to be true for that to be true. Well, if all the guests are there, and all the guests are happy, and all the guests have great memories, then all the guests are there and happy with the ceremony forever. Okay. And then we go one step further. You go, okay, all the guests are there. Well, we need to be true for that to be true. And they usually do that when I do my training stuff. That's an example I use very regularly in training to, you know, for board level all the way to quite junior because everyone can get their head around it. And we go, oh yeah, all the guests are there. We know the buzzwords below. It's going to be sort of invitation, um, availability, location. And what you've done is you take from one to three to nine to 27 to 81, if the issue is really strategic, 243. And what you've managed to do in one fell swoop, if I take that again, what you have is you've got a big issue, you break it down into its component parts, and then you get massive clarity. And if you turn 19 degrees, da -da -da, 90 degrees, what you have here now is a work plan. It's the stuff you need to do for the wedding to succeed. Okay, that's as simple as that. Now, um, there's one example I love more than anything else. I, I often give it to people as a homework, okay? We're gonna do it together quickly. It goes like that. Imagine, what should I do with my life? Now, lots of people uh, carry a question like that in their minds, okay? And they go, what should I do with my life? Oh, please hold how hard a question it is to carry in your mind. What should I do with my life? What should I do with my life? What does Barbara mean to say? Uh, put a pyramid, get rid of the question, carry the outcome. And you know what the outcome is going to be? And my little my little hack is always put the word success in it. It always works. You go, my life is a great success in 10 years. And you're like, okay, what needs to be true for that to be true? I don't know. In, in COVID times where people might be anxious, the thing that might spring to mind is, go, okay, if, if, if I'm alive and I'm healthy, and then you kind of relax a bit and go, okay, if I'm alive and healthy and, and I have a well-paying job, then my life is a great success. Okay. And then you do the second go through. You go, okay, can I think of a scenario where I'm alive, I'm healthy, I have a great job, and yet the one above is not automatically true. Oh yeah, if, I, if, if I'm not happy. Okay, so we have alive, healthy, job, and happy. Let's turn these four into three. Let me, let's maybe merge alive and healthy. We probably don't need two separate building blocks for that. Let's just put them into one. 
by the way, job, let's put it in the middle as part of wealth. And then let's put happiness. Okay, now we've got, now you kind of go, oh yeah, that structure feels a little bit more right. Okay, my life is a great, my life is okay. What would need to be true for my life to be great? If I'm healthy and wealthy and happy, then my life, okay. Now, some of you might go, actually, I don't really care about the first two. I really care about happiness. You just reorder the structure. And so the structure works, but you've slightly changed the order that fits you better. Now, let's play the game again. I'm healthy. Well, we need to be true for that to be true. It wouldn't take you too long to realize that a really good way to split that might be something like, if you know, if my body is healthy and my mind is healthy and my soul is healthy, then I'm going to be healthy. Wealthy, if I have a well-paying job and some degree of savings and the beginning of some assets, then I'm well on my way to be wealthy. And if I've got amazing romance and close family and warm friends, then I'm really happy. And uh, if we wanted to play the game one more time, you know, fit body, you might go, okay, exercise, nutrition, sleep. And can you see that as I showed to you, we start with great successful life. And then at some point you end up with, you know, exercise, nutrition, sleep, blah, 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 blah. Now, if we were to go exercise and you break it down, you go, you know, join a gym, walk as much as you can and uh, run whenever you have the opportunity. Can you see that what we started with was a great ambition and a vision that we were, well, sorry, we started with a question. How do I make my life successful? We turn that, or what should I do with my life? We turn that into a positive vision. We break it down into components and then we turn it 90 degrees and now you've got your work plan. It's a phenomenal technique, okay? So the pyramid principle is a beautiful way to help people uh, arrive at an outcome when they have a pretty good idea of what the outcome is. And please note, in my life is a great success. It's an outcome that you carry like this. It's not a, you know, it's, an, it's not an outcome you can you can say, oh, I want exact, I want 8.6 million. It's just like, no, my life is a great success. It's a loose intent of destination. It's what some people might call a strategic intent. And then you work backwards, first by breaking it down into its components. And then as a reward, you also get the work plan. So that was the, the pyramid principle. Um, you get, so I'm going to send you, or you can get the slide if you want with one page. You can do a screenshot. It's as easy. And these are sort of the eight tips that Barbara Minto suggests. Um, I forgot to mention, I think maybe Barbara Minto was the first uh, uh, woman hired by McKinsey as a professional. She was the first female professional at McKinsey in the US in the sort of late 60s or 70s. And she was really good at that, um, at uh, uh, structuring issues. Now I see a couple of Q&A comments, so I'm going to stop sharing for a minute. Uh, there you go. So there's a great question from Gilles that says, any tips on the way to formulate the desirable outcome? Um, the others are more sort of specific questions about the, uh, the slides itself. So Gilles, my suggestion is effectively you go, every time you carry a question, you'll have like, how, you know, um, uh, or, you know, what should I do with my life? There's a verb that kind of usually a future oriented, what should I do? How do I do? What, what, uh, eliminate that. Write the, the desirable outcome in the present, in the present tense. So my life is a great success. Our wedding is fabulous. And usually I would go simple as you go, th think of the thing. So is it your life, your wedding, your business, uh, your investment, da, da, da. Use a present tense, is, and then successful. And then sometimes you want to give yourself a little bit of opportunity to create a runway. So my, you know, our, our wedding is a great success. Uh, at the point of the wedding, so it's not that much in the future. So our wedding is a great success when it happens. When you go, my life is a great success in 10 years, in five years. And by the way, if you play the game of write it for in five years or 10 years or next year, you'll find the structure stays the same. What will change a little bit is the importance you will attach to each of the components. So uh, my small tip is make the sentence, the desirable outcome should be a short sentence with one name, one, one word, you know, so, um, uh, investment, life, uh, love, wedding, a simple verb in the present tense, and usually the adjective successful with a bit of runaway. Okay. Uh, let me see if we've got Emma. There you go. Lovely. And so uh, now um, I often talk to, you know, people who've been in business 10, 15, 20, 30 years, and, and I play a game that goes, uh, out of all the techniques you've learned and all the techniques you've seen, um, if 
if you had to, if you, you know, if one was removed from your brain, which one would you miss the most? And most people say that. Most people, quite senior executive mention the pyramid because once you're accustomed to it, you realize that every time a big issue comes your way, it usually comes in the shape of a question that makes people anxious. And when you learn to flip and split, which I think is my next slide. No, it's not. I, we've seen that slide already. Sorry. If you, if you learn to flip and split, you go, huh, let me turn it into a desirable outcome, split it into three. If you split it into three again, you turn one big issue into nine small ones. And two things happen. First, you feel a lot more comfortable because you understand what the problem is about. And second, out of the nine, quite a few of them are probably, you know, very simple. And one might be critical. For the wedding, it might be, you know, let's get the right venue in, in plenty of time. And so you become a lot more strategic at identifying where you deploy your resources to guarantee the outcome. So we've seen so far sort of two comments. The first one is around um, uh, uh, the mindset. Okay, so we talked about how should you think about strategic problems differently than you do day-to-day -day problems. And typically, you can't solve strategic problems just using the, uh, the expert mode. Da, 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 da. You actually can't often solve using the analytical mode because there's not enough data. Um, you could try and be creative, but if you're creative, you end up with ideas that are not implementable. And so the right way is to be strategic, to go up and down the roller coaster. If you have a pretty good idea of what the endpoint looks like, you use a pyramid principle. What if you have no clue? Well, if you have no clue, effectively what you're saying is, where we are today sucks, but I don't know where they end up. And that for that, the right answer is the mutation game, or the right technique is the mutation game. And the mutation game um, goes like this. A mutation, in practice, a mutation in biology is a small random variation. And oops, sorry, I should have put that on silence. Um, is a small random variation in the genes. What it means is really it's an error in the self-copying process. So nature um, sort of comes up with um, you know nature is full of, of proteins and DNA, and they copy each other, they copy one another, bing, you know, and they go copy, 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 and pop. Every so often there's a small mistake, and um, most companies eliminate mistakes. Uh, what Charles Darwin identified is actually nature is a lot smarter than most businesses because what nature does is it powers itself with the natural selection. And natural selection is the principle by which every time there's a mistake, we first check if it's any good and then the good ones we keep. And you might recognize it's a bit like the roller coaster. Have lots of mutations and then test if they're any good and then keep them. Yeah? Evolution is effectively the retention of the successful mistakes over millions of years. Now, in our case, we don't have millions of years. Let's pretend we have a few days, weeks, or months. And so what we're going to do in a business term is we're going to play the mutation game. You know, And you play the mutation game by doing the following. You write a sentence that describes the object you want to mutate. So whether you try to change a product, a process, a business, etc. Then for each sentence, you list a couple of variants and then you recombine them a bit differently the way nature would. Okay, So nature copies, copies, copies something and then boop, makes one mistake in one strand of the DNA and then checks if that mistake is worth it. Okay, uh, Let's do the, the following for the reception process at Google. So this is Google's um, office before their current one in, in London. So their old head office in London. Um, once more, come on, this game works really, really well in English. You'll see in a second, it's a bit harder in German or French. I'll explain why shortly, but it works really well in English. So it goes, describe what you see. Okay, um, the reception process, uh, sorry, describe what you see as a sentence. So, okay, so the reception process is uh, two people sitting behind desks, welcoming colleagues, visitors. Okay. Well, okay. Now, if nature had a go at that, nature would treat each, you know, would, would, uh, each component of DNA independently, and then it would replicate two people, two people, two people, two people, two people, and then boop, every so often it would make a small mistake, and that would be one person. And go, one person, one person, another, boop, another mistake might be nobody, or a few people, or everyone. Okay. And then you look at the next line, you go sitting, 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 sitting. If we reproduce it, it's always sitting. And then every so often, boop, small mistake, standing, uh, boop, walking around. Okay. And then you could see what's happening. Next level, we go behind desk, behind desk, behind desk, boop, in front of desk, in, in front of desk, in front of desk, on desks. 
because nature doesn't know that on desk is silly. So it goes on desks, on desk, on desk, you know, no desks. And then you you see what you see how it goes. Kind of welcoming could be turning in, sorry, turning away, ushering in, registering, uh, colleagues, visitors, or your own visitors, or anyone's visitors. And instead of visitors, it might be you know, deliveries of vehicles. And what we've done is, if you think about the green sentence here as your starting condition, is the current situation you're in. What we've created in one minute is a grid that contains. 2000 different ways to do this okay and a mutation is effectively where when you pick one uh, post-it from each line okay and on on the grid in front of us there's 2000 combinations there's 2000 ways to pick one from each line now of course we're not going to go through the 2000 uh, by hand uh, please note in a few years time you might give this grid to an artificial intelligent, artificial AI agent, you know, an artificial intelligence application that will just look at the 2000 and then come back to you and say, hey, here are the top 20 that I think you should have a look at. Um, because we can't do that just yet, what we're gonna do instead is eliminate a few suggestions on entry. So we quite like coming up with on desk, that was funny, but we're gonna ignore that because it's prob any solution that involves people being on desk, we're probably not gonna use. And we're gonna, we're gonna also ignore turning away, et cetera, et cetera. And so what we're left with now in this extraordinary simple skinny um, grid is still 90 mutation. It's still 90 ways to do the reception differently. So let's start with the obvious ones. 19, by the way, it's, it's, it's a large sample, but it's small enough that you could literally go one by one, you know, like on Tinder and kind of go, no, don't like, oh yeah, this one's pretty good. Don't, no, yes, okay. And so let's do one, let's go, okay. One person sitting behind desk, welcoming colleagues, visitors, okay. Uh, yeah, that could work if we put more beanbags, you know, to help people go through. How about nobody uh, sitting behind desk, welcoming colleagues, visitors? Uh, Oh yeah, yeah, that's a virtual receptionist. We put an iPad on there. Okay, 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 these are quite sensible. Let's go a bit crazier. Let's go, how about everyone walking in the open, welcoming colleagues, visitors. Everyone walking, okay, that feels a bit chaotic. I'm not sure we like that. Oh, actually, um, oops, sorry. Uh, actually, it's the Apple Store. Oh, okay. Yes, you're right. Everyone walking in the open. And can you see that now, if you've invented this idea, you might go, oh, um, that could be a mutation that we quite like and we might stay with that. Okay. So the mutation game is a fantastically good way. Uh, most of the mutation game is explaining what I'm doing on screen now, which is the difference between a sentence and the realization of what it could be. And the mutation game is a way to borrow from nature in the slight random generation of new sentences that are a slight variation of the situation you're starting with, and then quickly assess whether these combinations make any sense or not. Most of them are silly, but can you see sometimes you go, huh, maybe we could do the reception like Apple. Yeah? And by the way, you can see that the Apple store is just a mutation of the reception process. And then we do one last one. We go, okay, how about one person standing in front of desk, ushering in car? Yeah, that could work too. That'll be a bit like a restaurant. And so quickly in sort of like, you know, one minute. So uh, one minute to build the grid, one minute to go through four options. And um, if we had done that at speed, we've now have four or five different ways to organize the reception process. Um, I usually do uh, an exercise here where I go, how about if you're trying to reinvent the London taxi industry? Uh, okay, well, we, we would just go, and what I mean here, we'll come up with a sentence. I'll share mine in a minute. You could probably tell that in English, it works quite well because you'll have one or two words tick, 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 per block. In French, you might have a few small ones, you know, de la or, uh, uh, or ver. So it's a little bit easier in English than in, in German or in, in Latin languages. But here is my suggestion to you. You might go, okay, the taxi industry is individuals hailing in the street, random licensed taxis for a short ride. Yeah, that's the London black cab industry. And if you go, okay, how do we do something different about that? Now, please note, can you see that if you go, okay, this is not working anymore. We don't like it. We want something different. The natural temptation is to brainstorm it. Let's just brainstorm. Brainstorm is fabulous with one little flow, two little flow. Uh, the first is once you finish with brainstorm, you usually have quite a long list of ideas. 
but you don't know what you've missed. Okay, it's not systematic, and that's a bit uh, problematic. And the second one is because the brainstorm is not structured, you can't just go back over your work and then explain the likelihood that a mutation is going to go well. Whereas here, we fix both issues. Uh, let me suggest how. So first, so we've got the grade for taxis. What do we do next? Well, instead of in, you know nature, individuals, individuals, individual, boop, groups, 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 group, oh, boop, oh, objects. Hailing, what else than hailing could it be? Oh, reserving in the street at home, uh, from home or you know from anywhere random known approved blah 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 okay it's really obvious once you get the drill once you understand the, when you once you catch the drift and you kind of go oh yeah that's easy i write a starting condition i come up with alternatives and i recombine them differently okay so now i've got 324 mutations it's mind-blowing every time tiny grid like that 300 different ways to do the taxi industry to, to revamp the tax industry. Okay, let's look at one. How about individuals reserving from home random licensed ta random licensed taxis for a short ride? Historically, those of you who've been to London or who are UK residents will know, you know, mini cabs. And then you go, oh, how about if you muted that a bit more? Instead of from home, we do it from anywhere. And then random is approved. And instead of licensed taxis, why don't we go private drivers? Uh, that's Uber. Okay, let's do another one. Let's go individuals hailing in the street, random private drivers for a long ride. Individuals hailing in the street, random private drivers. Oh yeah, now that bit is hitchhiking. That's a silly idea. Oh, is it? Because if instead of now, if we mutate it one more time, we go, how about if instead of hailing, we reserve, instead of in the street, we go from anywhere and random approved. Now individuals reserving from anywhere, approved private drivers for a long ride. Oh, in continental Europe, everyone then goes, oh, that's blah, blah car. Of course I know that. And can you see that effectively, blah, blah car is a tiny mutation from hitchhiking, which is itself a small mutation of the taxi industry. And so what we've seen here is when you're faced with a situation, the green sentence, okay, oops, you can create a grid that helps you invent an Uber, 65 billion, or a blah, blah car, 3 billion, or sometimes, uh, you know, hitchhiking, which is worth zero. So not all of the ideas are great, but, and it's a really important thing, when you're stuck, you can't kill an idea that you haven't had. So the mutation game is a fantastic way to unstuck you. When you're stuck in a situation, write that situation. And instead of trying to come up with a complete alternative to the whole situation, you know, um, take each component of the DNA and splice it a bit and change it. Uh, my favorite, I'm gonna skip through that quickly. My favorite one was a friend, uh, my favorite one in a sort of personal context was a friend of mine who moved to the US and we were chatting, I'm going to say, sort of February-ish. And I was saying, how's it going? And he was saying, oh, it's really painful because all they do is eat with their families in winter. So he was finding it really hard to socialize in the US, you know, Thanksgiving, Christmas, uh, Super Bowl. It was like lots of eating with family in winter. I said, look, if you're a bit stuck, mutation game. Instead of eating, what else could it be? And you go, oh, yeah eating or drinking or, you know, playing sports with family, uh, with friends, with strangers in winter, you know, in summer, in, in autumn. Now, can you see how extraordinarily simple that is when you have just three and three, you've got 27 mutation. Whoa, that's still 27 things you could do differently to improve your social life. And so here, uh, mutation one, eating with family in winter is the one he, he, he didn't like. And then I asked him, you know, can you fill in the grid? And he came up with, you know, lots of ideas, blah, 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 blah. And when you have 27, as you, if you, you know, cast your eyes down that list, you might go, oh yeah, that's not for me. That's not for me. That's, oh yeah, that's a good idea. Oh, that's a really good idea. Yeah, why not? And what you've done is you start from a situation where you're stuck with a sentence. And actually, if I give you, if I give you the, the one page instructions here, um, you start, you're stuck with a situation. And for that, I would say craft a description pick a sentence and write, a, pick a situation and write a description of the starting condition, okay? Uh, we've seen one about taxis, we've seen one about the reception process at Google, we've seen one about my friend and social life in the, in the US. Um, usually, you know, five, four, five or six green post-it, seven is probably the maximum. Then you come across a few alternatives, 
Okay, so craft a description, generate alternative words, so build a grid, and then recombine it, and then see what ideas that generates. Um, if you look on the right here, I've got four big ideas from this grid. If you look at the bottom one, uh, I, I haven't gone in details, but what you see is a number at the bottom, one, 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 three, one, one, one. What that is, is effectively the postcode or the address of the ID. And you can see that on the grid, the starting sentence is one. Uh, the second column is two, three, four, five. If an ID was one, 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 it just means the starting condition. If it's one, one, three, one, 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 we've done blah, 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 click, blah, 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 which means we've changed a tiny bit and we still come up with a great idea. Uh, usually these ideas are very easy to implement because they're very similar to what you were doing, but a tiny difference. Um, big ideas see here are usually a lot harder, you know, five, four, five, two, four, one, five. What it tells you is five, four, five, two, four, one, five. You've really gone and picked and combined a lot of things that are very different from what you're doing today. It might be a fantastic idea. More often than not, it's the illusion of a fantastic idea. Yeah, the grass is always greener. So a tip that you'll find uh, in my book is that a really good way to optimize a mutation game is if you try and come up with two or three non-ones in the postal code. And you can probably see that if it has two or three non-ones, it's sufficiently far from what you're currently doing that it's a new pasture you hadn't necessarily thought of before, but it's sufficiently similar that the farming of that pasture or the, the building of that solution is going to be somewhat uh, easy for you. Okay. Um, if I talk about a very specific example, um, uh, a client of mine uh, works, uh, runs an advertising network all over Europe, putting display uh, units, both physical and, and digital, so screens, um, in the waiting rooms of uh, doctors. And when, uh, 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 when the COVID hit, their business was put completely on freeze because doctor surgery were closed. And they had to think of new ways to do business. And what we did is they were familiar with the petition game, but we kind of went, let's write a sentence of what their business is. So offering pharmaceutical advertising to unhealthy patients in doctor's waiting room. And then what else could it be? You know, selling, displaying, pharmaceutical, nutritional, healthcare, you know, beauty, et cetera, to a healthy, unhealthy, et cetera. You do all the grids and then very simply recombining a few. Now, please note in this one, the pyramid principle, most of what you do is really good because you create the vision and you build it downwards. The mutation game is a higher rate of loss because you try to find your way through things that are completely new. But if you accept that, you know, you go through 20 selection to get four ideas, it's a half hour process that's going to give you four fantastic ways to completely change a situation in which you're really, really stuck. And so um, in, um, in conclusion here, um, what we look at that as we go, um, what we've seen is the roller coaster of strategic thinking is a strategic mindset, which we saw, and 12 techniques. And I walk you through two. Um, the first one is the pyramid, which is when you have a vague idea of what the desirable outcome is, but you get too anxious by asking yourself, how do I get there? You know, what should I do with my life? How do I make a great wedding? How do I make my investment successful? And you flip it and split it. So here is flip and split. And then the mutation game is when you are currently stuck in a situation that you don't like and you don't really know what to do next. So if the pyramid is super convergent, you're really close to the structure and the options. The mutation game is very divergent, which is the thing you use first as a way to get started. Okay. And then uh, as mentioned, there's more uh, in my uh, book. And now let's see what questions we have on the mutation game. Okay. So there was an interesting question. So if we go back a little bit to the uh, the pyramid principle, it, uh, if, if one's mind automatically goes to the pyramid principle for so many executive, is it possible we're limiting our ability to deliver novel solutions? Um, I wouldn't say so. Because effectively, a novel solution, um, if it doesn't work, it's not a solution. So it has to, a solution is, a novel solution is an interface between an outcome that you seek 
and a current situation. And one of the best ways to identify the novel solution is to work backwards and ask yourself, what would need to be true for the outcome that I seek to be achieved? And sometimes you identify indeed a series of things that are well known, like for the you know organization of a wedding, um, sometimes, and I'm not a, I'm not a, a kind of fanboy of Elon Musk, the the uh, uh, the social media person, or even the billionaire. But I'm a great fan of Elon Musk, the problem solver, because he uses something called first principles. And whether it's in space exploration or um, electric cars or batteries, one of the things Elon Musk does is literally use the period principle, and then at, when you hit a problem where an answer is uh, hasn't been cracked before, you use a few more layers of period principle and you find a different way to either approach the, the physics or the economics of the problem to crack it. Okay, so um, that was me. I don't have any other questions. So hopefully that was uh, reasonably uh, clear and hopefully you found that reasonably uh, interesting. And in terms of logistics, you're going to get some slides. I think the the, the call, the, um, uh, the webinar is going to be on uh, YouTube. You, uh, the participants are going to receive slides and um, I look forward to um, seeing you um, at maybe one of my trainings or, you know, hearing your feedback on the book on Amazon or um, Goodreads. Thank you very much. I was Fred Pollard. It's lovely to be with you. Bye-bye.